Hi, I'm Jackie Tantillo, and this is Should Have Listened to My Mother. My guest has a story to share that has many parallels between her mother, her career as a journalist, scientists, and working women worldwide. People say times change, but in this particular conversation, it's hard to believe that after decades of women making major strides in the workforce, suddenly you take a look and realize maybe we're not as progressive as one would have hoped. Kate Zernicki is a 2002 Pulitzer Prize-winning national correspondent for The New York Times. She's the author of Boiling Mad, Inside Tea Party America from 2010. Her most recent book, The Exceptions, Nancy Hopkins, MIT and the Fight for Women in Science. My guest originally broke this story in 1999 as a reporter for the Boston Globe. Science is not new to Kate. Her father and grandfather were physicists, and her grandfather won the Nobel Prize in Physics for the invention of the phase contrast microscope. Kate recalls at a young age when her mother was interested in applying to law school. Advice her mom received was less than encouraging, and yet today it's been suggested that perhaps Kate is finishing up what her mother started. But I'd like Kate Zernicki to fill in those details. Yes. Welcome to Should Have Listened to My Mother. Thank you, Jackie. It's so nice to join you. You have many stories that we're going to share. First of all, I'd like to start out with your mom's name and how did you refer to her? Yeah, so my mother was Barbara. She was born in Virginia, which was unusual. Her parents were living in Virginia for three weeks, or sorry, three months in uh, 1931. And so my mother was born there and she was given the Southern name of Barbara Ann. Um, mm. But so she was Barbara Ann Bacchus Zernicki. Um, and we called her mom or, you know, sometimes, I don't know. Anyway, my kids called her Oma, which was the, because my father was Dutch, we used the Dutch word for grandmother and we called her Oma. And and you're, you have two brothers, I believe. Yeah, I have two brothers who are um, both older than I am. Uh, so the uh, oldest is five years older, then three years older, and then I'm the baby. I'm the only girl. <laughs> Did they watch over you and protect you, everyone you talked to and dated and all that kind of thing? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because some people tore it, like, especially when my father was dying, people would say, oh, you know, daddy's little girl and princess and all this. And I, I definitely, my brothers definitely put me for, through the ringer. This was, not, <laughs> this, was, this was boot camp, not any princess castle. Um but no, my brothers, I think my brothers, you know, my brothers and my parents are both responsible for me having a sense of humor. <laughs> oh, fantastic. That's very, very important. Your mom was way ahead of her time. And I love how you were able to, whether you went back and, and had to research it or you really remember some of this stuff, because I believe in your book, you know, The Exceptions book that you just wrote, that you mentioned how your mom wanted to go to law school. Yeah. Let's go back for just a minute and tell us a little bit about your mom. What was she like at home? I know she worked in a bank and, and she yes. went to undergrad. And so a little bit about what was she a homemaker? What was the vibe in, in your home? Yeah, so she definitely, when we started out, she was definitely, you know, we lived in Fairfield County, Connecticut, which is pretty, you know, quintessentially suburban, bedroom community of New York City. Uh, and she was, yeah, she was a mom. Uh, she had three kids. She was raising us. She made our lunches. Uh, she was, she ran the local volunteers. It, it was called VIN Volunteers in Norwalk Schools. She was very involved in local politics. She, um, I think she, I can't remember, she was on the Civic Association in our town. She was asked to run for mayor at some point. She really did a lot. She was, <laughs> later in her life, she was shellfish commissioner of the city of Norwalk, which was very, very cool. Wow. Um, but yeah, she's, so my mother graduated from college in 1954. And this is the story that I tell in the book that you allude to. Uh, she graduated from college in 1954, University of Toronto, and she wanted to go to law school. And so she talked to her father, who was a banker in Toronto, and he went and consulted his lawyer friends, and they all said, well, we wouldn't hire a woman. And my father went back, my grandfather went back and said, you'll never get a job. And my mother agreed with him, which does have parallels to the story I tell about Nancy Hopkins and the exceptions. Um, so my mother agreed, and she went to business school instead, but she went to, uh, women were not allowed at Harvard Business School, were not accepted. So my mother went to the Radcliffe Program in Business Administration. Um, and... Uh, 
What was interesting to me when, so when I was writing The Exceptions, my mother, um, I started in 2018, my mother died in 2020. And after she died, I found an old scrapbook, which it's funny because I had seen this scrapbook before and I had noticed it only for, you know, invitations to dances and wedding notices and, you know, masks she had worn for different costume parties and things like that were, were you know, in the pages of this. But after she died, I found this section on her years at the Radcliffe program. Um, and there was a Wall Street Journal article. It was a front page article. And it was the the middle column from the journal, which was reserved for sort of, you know, cute, cute light stories. And it was a story from 1956 about this program at Radcliffe, the year that my mother was there. Um, and it was saying, you know, these women were very bright and they, you know, the Harvard was giving them just the same education as the, as the men got to Harvard business school. And it spoke to all these bank leaders who were saying, you know, we, these women are terrific and we love having them at the bank, but we can't keep them around because they're just, there are too many young men at the bank and they just get married. The, the women are too good looking and they get married too fast. Oh um, my God. So it was really interesting <laughs> to me. And, and, you know, the reality is my mother, so my mother went to, she went to this program in, um, at Radcliffe. She worked for the Harvard Business Review for a while. She met my father. Um, and while they were dating, she moved to New York and lived on her own. They had a commuting relationship for a while. And then they got married and she did, she left the bank. She worked at Citibank or I think it was then called City, the City Bank. I can't remember. Anyway, um, she moved back to Cambridge with my dad and then they moved to Connecticut because of my father's job. And she didn't work for a number of years. When I was, again, I was the youngest. And when I went back to, when I went to kindergarten, she began working or when I went to school, she began working for legal services, um, which is a, you know, it's a volunteer mm -hmm. program as a paralegal. And they encouraged her to go to law school. And this was now the early 70s and things had opened up for women. So my mother got the idea, got the idea to go back, go to law school. Um, and she went and she interviewed at Yale because that was close to our house. And there was a man in the admissions office there who said to her, well, I wouldn't let my wife go to law school. Yeah, I read um, that in so, your book. And right. I was just like, yeah, I almost fell over. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, but, but you think about it, this was the early 70s and, you know, things were, quote unquote, opening up for women. But there were still these attitudes. And that's that's really what the exceptions is all about, is how these attitudes, despite all this progress, attitudes have held us back. So my mother ended up going, you know, she wasn't going to go to Yale. <laughs> after that experience. Um, and so she ended up going to Pace University in which was, was had a law school in White Plains uh, in Westchester, um, which had, I think it was in the second year of the, of its law school program. And she went there and she graduated. And then sometime after that, she, um, she went to look herself up in the Harvard alumni directory. And this again is a story I tell in the book. Um, Harvard had said at some point, at some point, Harvard and, and Radcliffe were moving more toward a merger. And Harvard at some point had said every Radcliffe degree is now a Harvard degree, undergrad as well as graduate. So my mother goes to look herself up in the Harvard alumni directory and she finds her name and it says Barbara Zernike, you know, Barbara Zernike Nabakis, uh, BA, MBA, JD, W slash M. And my mother was like, okay, I get the degrees, but what is W slash M? And she goes and she looks herself up in the, she looks her, looks that up in the key and W slash M stands for wife and mother. As my husband points out, there was no H and F. <laughs> there was no husband and father. Um, so, and, and I was, you know, probably 11 or 12 at this point. And, she, and I was sitting on the steps of the law library where I had spent a lot of time. And I just remember my mother coming raging out of the door of the law library, yanking me away into the car and the whole way home, which was like, you know, half an hour, 40 minute drive, just raging about this W slash M thing. And I didn't, I couldn't understand as a kid that age, I understood that it was offensive to my mother, but I don't think I could understand maybe even until I had kids of my own, how... Um, how devalued she felt by this, how Absolutely. it was like, despite everything else she'd done, she was still identified by this one thing. And it's not that there was anything wrong with being a wife and mother. It's just that that was only a limited part of her experience. And yet she had been reduced to that. She was, by the way, I should say, she was also commuting three hours a day round trip at this point to a job in New York City. So she was working as a lawyer. She had gotten her undergrad. She had gotten her MBA. She had gone. Yeah, she got to her law, law degree. She was working as a lawyer, and she got. By the way, she'd gone to law school at forty at age forty five. Like that's not. I think you have to put yourself. You have to sort of um, subsume your ego a bit to do that. To do that <laughs> to with that three kids at home. So what was that? Yeah. Do you remember what it was? Was it chaotic or anything at home? Or? Oh my God, chaotic, chaotic. So you know, again, growing up in Fairfield County, Connecticut, my dad worked as a physicist. Everybody else's dad, it seemed to me, worked 
in New York City, put on a trench coat and went to the train, you know, the whatever it was, the 6.32 in the morning, um, took the train to an advertising, a job as an advertiser or a lawyer or a banker and came home at night on the train and they had a mom at home. And my mother, you know, <laughs> we had like the traditional wood panel station wagon, but there were like law books on the floor, oh. and, you know, <laughs> cross rod torque. It just, it, it was a very different experience. But as my mother points out, like, she, as I said, she was always running the house and she was doing the homemaker things. But, you know, at, at the age of seven, when my mother went to law school, she walked us all down to the laundry machine and said, this is the washer. This is the dryer. You sort your whites from your darks. Here's how much detergent you put in. And from that point on, we did our own laundry. And I don't think I realized that not every kid did that. Um, so it definitely, you know, it was, it was, it was a disruption to me, but ultimately it, you know, I just didn't realize I didn't realize that it, you ha had any different, like it never occurred to me not to have a career and not, that I wouldn't go out into the world and sort of, you know, make something of myself beyond, you know, beyond the domestic sphere. Right. So that's just one gift that your mother gave you. Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> the same thing with my boys. I made sure they knew how to do their laundry, probably right as they were going into sixth grade. Um, yeah, because yeah. I just put pieces of tape with the number one on it. Then this was number two. You check this one, and this one was number three. And I think they're still on the machine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do remember. Like, I remember my brother Harry and I, who's the next oldest, going to school one morning, and it must have been one of the first times we made lunches for ourselves because um, I just remember this vividly that he had done it wrong. Instead of putting peanut butter on the bread first, he put jelly on the bread first. And like, if you put if you put jelly on first, it doesn't quite work. <laughs> So that was, like, that was like a learning experience for us, was just making our own sandwiches. Did you um, try and tell him that he was doing it wrong or you didn't even bother? I think I probably did because, I, I mean, you know, you here made I am. Your own. When, yeah, well, here I am 40-something years later and I'm still remembering it. So, right. um, and five years younger at the time, though, but you knew right, better. Right. Three years, yeah. <laughs> Three yes, years, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but my mother was definitely, you know, my mother was a very vivid presence in our lives. And when she died, it was, inter you know, I... I you know, sort of a somewhat of a tribute. We never had a service for her, which was hard because she died in the middle of COVID. Um, and, uh, but I did put tributes up to her on social media. And I remember friends of mine saying, you know, you're so lucky to have a mother who you could admire that way. And it, it that was really striking to me that I had friends who were my age, you know, women who are now in their 40s and 50s saying to me that they, and this is, you know, it's two women, so not a huge sample size, but same day they didn't respect what their mothers had done and they hadn't grown up respect. And I just, I, it, it just had never occurred to me that that was even a choice. You know, my mother definitely made herself someone, you know, a, a force to be reckoned with in a good way. You think, you assume that everybody else's mom is doing as much as your mom was doing, right? And had the same effect yeah. and, until yeah. we're at this age when we are either wise enough or old enough to appreciate and open your eyes. I'm still learning every minute of yeah. every day. And I think it was understanding how people view women and how they, what they expect of women, what, what role you're supposed to take, what behavior you're supposed to have that was... It, that was an eye opener to me. I mean, in some ways I could say, you know, given the theme of your podcast, it's like I could say my mother almost didn't prepare me enough for um, for that, you know, because I think we don't yet expect women to be 100% full participants in society. And so sometimes when you try to assert yourself, people are a little surprised. And I think that was that was a surprise to me because of who my mother was. Wow. And what was her mom like? What was your maternal grandmother oh, like? So interesting. So my grandmother, who we called Oma, um, my mother, my mother was very close to her parents. She was an only child. Um, but you could tell that she definitely had more respect for her father. Um, my grandmother was a very, you know, she was funny. Um, she could be acerbic. Uh but my mother clearly chafed against her. And I think my mother, um, you know, there's that picture that I sent you where my mother is a young girl and she's sort of pulling away from her mother. You know, my grandmother has her arms, her hands on my mother's shoulders. And my mother's sort of, you know, half dashing out of the frame of the photo. Um, and that's sort of my, that's their relationship to me. It just, there was this sense that like my mother didn't, she didn't want to live a life that her mother had lived, which was very much the wife of a banker who stayed home, who's, you know, who, when she went outside the house, it was to have lunch and to shop and to do, 
you know, sort of social things. So interesting, the body language in that photo. Yes, yeah. But I think my grandmother wanted to do more, but she just, I mean, forget it in the 1930s. There just was no, you know, there was no room for her. But but I do think my mother saw her mother chafing under those restrictions and thought, well, why don't you just burst out of them? The way my mother's sort of trying to burst out of that photograph. Yeah, yeah. Wow, very interesting. But you know what? If it took one more generation, your mom, yeah. she broke that chain and... Here we are. You are. Yeah. <laughs> you're very lucky. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're so, so much of this comes to me because, because in the, you know, she died it's now three years ago. It comes to me in reflections from my friends after my mother died. So when my mother died, I sent out a note to, you know, a group of close friends. And I just described, because some of them didn't know my mother, most of them did, because my mother really enjoyed our meeting our friends. Um, and I said, you know, as a single as an only child, I think she really enjoyed having a bunch of kids around. Um, Hmm. But she, um, (laughs) so I talked about like, you know, what she was like and, and just for anyone who didn't know her. And I said, you know, she saved every a commemorative edition of every magazine and every newspaper when Winston Churchill died. Like she had this real thing about Winston Churchill um, because she, you know, she'd grown up in Toronto and there had been babies, you know, kids who came over from England to live the war, live out the war in Canada for safety. Um, so the Canadians were really directed their gaze toward, toward London at the time. Um, and it, so a friend of mine wrote and he said, a friend of mine who's a law professor and did know my mother wrote back and he said, it's funny that you say this about your mother and Winston Churchill. He said, because when his wife asked him what my mother was like, he said, he said, I told her Winston Churchill, which is sort of funny, but I mean, it really was like my mother kind of, there was a sense when my mother was around um, that, I mean, definitely a sense that she was in charge, that everything was on track, that we were a little bit, you know, not necessarily going to war, but we could, you know. Um, And in fact, a few, you know, probably six weeks before she died, um, and we knew she was dying. She had, uh, she had her fourth round of cancer, um, and this one was not going to be beatable. Um, she, my my younger son, had some problems in school, and I think that I felt the school had reacted badly, and um, and so I was talking to my mother about what I was going to do and and what I should do and my different options, and she said well, you know me, I love to go to war. (laughs) And I just thought, (laughs) yes, you do. So, you know, for better and for worse, right? (laughs) Yeah, it's one thing that I miss because my mom passed in 2014, but I I miss talking to her about my boys. Mm -hmm. She was always there for me when they were little and I was struggling. I'm like, this one's doing this. Absolutely. But yeah. yeah. But I so I still talk to her every day. I mean, that's I do too. It's especially around raising my kids. It's really it's kind of amazing. I get her responses in many different ways and here I am mm-hmm. talking about moms every day. Yep. <laughs> so I'm yeah, very very yeah. lucky. And your dad, would they ever have time to go do something fun or go off on a date or was it always family? Oh, yeah. So no, no, it's funny you say that. So um or you ask that my parents Sometimes I would talk about my parents, what they were doing, and and people would assume that my parents were divorced because my mom, which is so strange to me, um, because you know my mother would be doing something with friends, or they would be going here, or she would be flying somewhere on her own. But but no, they they traveled often together, and they really I think they really did have when my father died first, and my mother said to me, you know, he really did have a lot of fun. Um, so they. They were really good at traveling together and having adventures together. I, you know, again, when he died, people talked about people who'd been at parties with him talked about what great parties my parents threw and, you know, how they were such amazing dancers and, and they did really love to dance, but they also, um, my father, as I said, was Dutch. And so he was, um, he was put in charge of a company in Liechtenstein at a certain point, and then he worked for a Dutch company, and I'm trying to think what else. Oh, then he, after he retired, he was worked as a contractor for Zeiss, which is the big um, German company. So they had a chance to, to travel and live abroad quite a bit um, when we were in high school or in college oh, or even after great. college. Yeah, so they really traveled together a lot, and I think they did have sort of a very, um, very adventurous life together. And I don't remember. I'm trying to think. I guess they did go out because I know we had, I remember our, our steady babysitter growing up. I guess they did have nights when they went out alone. Um, uh, but it's more what I, when I think of them together, it's more on these trips they would take. And, um, you know, those did sort of seem like great adventures. So, no, I think my parents had a pretty strong relationship and did have very much a life 
separate from their kids. And that's another aspect that we may have taken for granted, that assuming all of our friends' parents had as wonderful relationships as our own parents did. Because my parents yeah. were madly in love with each other, and they traveled, and they, they respected one another. Yeah. They were there to back each other with the seven kids and help out here, there, and everywhere. And that mutual respect that they had for each other was key, I think. And that's key even today for any family and any relationship. It's very important. Yeah, I will also say my father was very important in terms of shaping my understanding of what my mother was doing and and feminism and the importance of women. Really, the it, you know, my, my book agent said to me at one point, you know, oh, your father was a feminist. And I, I said, well, he's more of a humanist. Like, I think he just, when my mother went to law school and I was seven and I sort of chafed because she wouldn't, you know, she might not be there to do the things during the day that she had done before that other mothers seemed like they were doing and you know, getting <laughs> climbing into the car with all the law books. And I was like, why can't we just be like any other family in Fairfield <laughs> County? Um, and my dad said, I remember we would go on these long walks on the beach and he would say, you know, this is something that's really important for your mother to do for herself. Um, and so he was really an ally for her on that. I don't think it was always easy on him. I mean, it was sort of, because my mother, for one thing, this drove him crazy. She always insisted on making dinner. And finally, my father was like, look, I don't have the long commute you do. Let me cook. Um, oh, which was, my gosh. That was an adventure in itself. Sweetheart. No, but it was like, <laughs> but it was like, and my mother really felt like she had to do everything. Like she was not enough to just have the job. She had to sort of keep up this, you know, right. W slash M role, um, which I, I do think is a pressure that women still feel, um, despite all the progress we've seen. I love that your father spoke to you specifically about your mom and her work. Yes. I mean, that is, and that's when I, I when you were doing your interview at the Montclair Library, yeah. um, the thing that struck me most is your father speaking openly to his young daughter about that this is your future too. You are capable of doing all of this, but it's young boys and girls. This is what their normal should be. Yes, seeing women yeah. in the workforce and that gender equality and no discrimination. And if you're good at your job, then mm -hmm. why shouldn't you do your job, regardless if you're right. wearing pants or a skirt? It's brilliant that your dad spoke to you about that specifically, because it's also how the family stays together when the couple and the mom and dad are on the same team. Right, right. I know you broke the story in 99 about the, mm. the scientists at MIT. What was going on in your mind between when you broke the story and then this book coming out now in 2023? I, so yeah, so I broke the story in 1999 and the story was that MIT had acknowledged, acknowledged that it had discriminated against women on its faculty even in recent years. And that story was broken because that story happened because a group of female scientists at MIT gathered the data and gathered the stories to show how they'd been discriminated against and convinced the men, including the president of the university, to acknowledge this. Um, my dad had talked to me about discrimination against women in science. I had initially ignored him, but when this story happened, I recognized that this was a big deal. But I really did think about my mother when this story happened. I I, at the time, when the story happened, I, again, I think I, I won't say I took it for granted, but I was like, okay, this story, this is a great story, fascinating. I, I think part of me thought, okay, well, we took care of that, right? Like, there were now, as a result of this story, it went, you know, went viral. There were all these programs to get more women into science. There was real attention on the issue for the first time um, and real efforts to, to solve the problem, to get more women into the highest levels of science and math. This is 1999, which seems like yesterday to me, but... Right, but not 1959. <laughs> right, you know. and, and they, these are 16 scientists, female scientists yes. at MIT that came forward, not as activists, you mentioned the book. They just yeah. wanted, they wanted to get back to work and they wanted to have things yes. fair and square. Yes, they wanted to live their lives as scientists. In 1999, I thought the story was amazing. These women reminded me of my mother. Um, and, and sort of, you know, my mother's experience had said to me, this is all that that the the struggle for women is all about opening doors. And what these women at MIT showed me was that it was not enough to just open doors. You had to think about how you're viewing women, how you're talking women about women, how you're treating women, what resources you're giving them throughout their career. So again, like if you're just opening the doors to women but still seeing them as W slash M, that's not enough. So that was sort of an advancement in my own understanding. But I thought, like so many young women do, I thought, okay, you know 
brush hands together all done there. Um, and then I would hear about the, I, you know, then in, in 2005, there was this episode where Larry Summers, the president of Harvard, uh, was talking about women in science. And he said that one of, you know, there were a couple of reasons. One was that women didn't want to work 80 hour weeks. Um, and another was that women lacked the intrinsic aptitude to do math and science at the highest levels. And Nancy was the one who stood up and said, wait a minute, that's not right. There's no data to back that up. Um, so I knew that there was still an issue in 2005. I think it kept hitting me in different ways. And again, the problem evolves, right? Like we do make progress. It's not, we're not standing still, um, but we're not, it, but it's a little bit two steps forward, one steps back, one step back. Um, there's this wonderful analogy in the play, What the Constitution Means to Me, which is all about women's rights. And she talks about progress for women being like you're watching a woman walking her dog on the beach and the dog keeps going back and circling around a, a certain spot and then goes forward and then circles a little bit more. So if you're watching the, if you're watching this woman, you think, oh, she's not making much progress because the dog keeps pulling her back. But in fact, she is actually slowly moving across the beach. Mm. Anyway, so... Um, <laughs> so which think, is important. So it's, it's it is important. Right, right. And I remember when I watched the, the play, I was like, oh, yes, that's it. Um, so 2007, I had my first child, my second child in 2009. Um, and I... I think it was really after that that I began to have people, you know, I'd always been one of those women who people were like, oh, she's too ambitious. She's too, you know, she's trying too too fast, too, too much. Um, and so I was always like trying, you know, I was trying to make myself nicer. Um, and after I had kids, I mean, I thought it was like something about my personality. And after I had kids, I started to hear like the very specific ways in which people were looking at me differently because I had kids. And it was as if, I mean, I say to people, it was as if I had pushed my ambition out with a placenta. Like I just, you know, suddenly it was, well, you know, she can't travel or she can't have that job or you wouldn't want this job. You know, people would say to me things like, and by the way, men and women would say to me, well, I, I assumed you wouldn't want that job. Oh or my gosh, I was it told, drives me crazy. Yeah. I was told you couldn't travel or, you know, I remember, I remember going out, this was like, even when my kids were, I don't know, teenagers, I would say, um, I was going to go out for a drink with a friend and he had had a previous plan with another guy. So we were all going to go out together. And I showed up and this third guy says, the second guy, third person says to me, oh, you got the night off? And I was like, I was so taken <laughs> aback. Like, well, and, and he had a child the same age I did. And I, like the appropriate response would have been like, yeah, how about you? You know, I mean, it was just sort of like, right. um, so I think in between have, in between doing the story in 1999 and writing the book, I had started to see it affect my own life, but I had also, you know, again, beginning of 2018, when I started thinking about the book and when Nancy was trying to figure out what to do with her archives, the Me Too movement was surging. And I was watching that thinking that, okay, this a really egregious sexual assault and sexual harassment, that is a part of the problem. But we're not, we're still not talking about the whole problem and the underlying problem, which is that we're, we're not taking women as seriously as we take men, particularly when it comes to, to their intellectual abilities. So that was, um, and, and their professional lives. And so that was really what brought me back to this story, the idea of doing it as a book. I'm so glad that you did. The book is called <laughs> The Exceptions. You. It's really extraordinary. The Exceptions, Nancy Hopkins, MIT and the Fight for Women in Science. Kate Zernicki, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, Jackie. And we'll be back next week with another episode of Should Have Listened to My Mother. Mm -hmm.